We've been studying the solutions to the least squares problem for fitting models to data or building classifiers. In this video, we're going to look at the geometry of the squared error surface, which we're minimizing. Our objectives are to develop a visual representation for the cost function f of w that we're trying to minimize with respect to w. We're going to do that by looking at some special cases and then commenting on the most general case. Recall that the squared error is written as the two norm squared of the difference between A, W, and D, where A is a matrix containing n rows of features, W is our p-dimensional model parameters, and D are the n labels associated with the features in A. Our goal is to find W that minimizes this cost function, or we could rewrite that as minimize over W f of W where f is this two norm squared. Now in finding the solution for w, we've looked at the geometry of the error. In other words, e being the difference between d and aw. We've shown that the error has to be orthogonal to the span of the columns of a. Now this geometry occurs in n-dimensional space because we're looking at the geometry of the n-dimensional error, e. What we're going to do in this video is focus on the geometry of f of w. So we're going to view the cost function f in terms of the p-dimensional vector w. So now we're going to look at a p-dimensional space involving the individual coefficients of w. So recall at the end of the previous video we wrote the cost function as w minus w0 quantity transpose times a transpose a times w minus w0 plus d times projection matrix p onto the space orthogonal to that span by the columns of a times d. And this last term was just the length of this error vector. And w0 was a transpose a quantity inverse times a transpose d. We know from our analysis that a transpose a is a positive definite matrix. That means that any vector transpose times a transpose a times the same vector is going to give us a value greater than zero as long as that vector is not the zero vector. Consequently, if w is not equal to w0, then f of w will always be greater than f of w0. Equality happens when w is equal to w0 because then this first term drops out and we're left with f of w0 just being equal to magnitude squared of the error vector. But f of w is always going to be greater than that, and it's going to depend on the values of w. We're going to start with an example where p, the number of parameters in w, is 1. So we have a matrix A containing single column, and then d, we'll say, is, for example, 1, 1.5. If I look for the value of w that minimizes the error between a w and d, I find that that value of w, and we'll call that w0, is exactly 1.25. So in this case, we've got a two-dimensional space because a has two rows, and the span of the columns of a lie along the 45-degree line. So a times w is always going to be constrained to lie on this blue line. Our d is out here at some point in space not on the line, and so when we project d onto the span of the columns of a, we get d hat, and this w, which is the coordinate, is going to be 1.25. So since a is 1, 1, we're going to have 1.25 on the horizontal axis and 1.25 on the vertical axis at that solution. Let's look at the geometry associated with w. So that can be written as w minus w0 transpose a transpose a times w minus w0 plus the magnitude of the error vector squared. Now if we substitute in for a transpose a, which turns out is just the scalar 2, and the fact that w is a scalar, this f of w becomes 2 times the quantity w minus w0 squared plus 1 eighth. And inspection reveals that this is a parabola. So we can graph the f of w as a function of w, so w is going to be some number along the axis, and f of w will be the value of the cost function in the vertical direction, and we're going to have a minimum at w0, so that's when w is equal to 1.25. The value of f of w is 1 eighth, and then we're going to have a quadratic function or a parabola 
that extends up as we move away from W0. So we see that the cost function is concave up, and there's a single minimum at W0. So let's extend this to a two-dimensional example for W. So suppose that A is this matrix I've indicated here, and suppose D is 0, 5, 12.5. Well, if I look at A transpose A, it ends up being 25 and 25 on the diagonal and 0 on the off-diagonal. So in this case, W has dimension P equals 2. So A transpose A is a 2 by 2 matrix. W0, the optimum solution, is negative 2 and 1. And my F of W is going to be 25 times W minus W0 transpose times W minus W0 plus our error squared term. Well, we can substitute for W0 and expand this out in terms of the elements of W, and we have 25 times W1 plus 2 quantity squared plus 25 times W2 minus 1 quantity squared plus our error squared term. So if I look at where is F of W equal to a constant, this last term is a constant, so we don't have to worry about that, and therefore we have a constant value for F of W. These first two terms equal some constant squared. And we're making a squared because this has to be positive. Each of these terms is positive, therefore the sum has to be positive. Now if we look at this equation, you recognize that this is the equation for a circle in W1 and W2 with radius c over 5, and it's centered at minus 2 comma 1. I've summarized the information on this next slide. So the cost function, f of w, is written down here. And we know that the values of w for which the cost function are constant, and these are equations for a circle. So they're centered on w0, which is at minus 2 and 1. So I can sketch these circles here, as shown, where I've got my center in pink, and then I've got a sequence of circles that have increasing radius as I go farther away from the center. So these contours, as I go away, have increasing values of c squared, and therefore they correspond to increasing values of f of w. So this outer contour here that it has a higher value for f of w than the inner contour does. So that's like a contour map. We can also draw this in a three-dimensional view where w1 and w2 lie in a plane, horizontal surface, and then f of w, the value of the cost function, represents the height above that plane. So we know that the minimum value for f of w occurs at w0, and that value is d transpose p a perp d. So f of w is that high above the w1, w2 plane at the minimum. And then we have circular contours that represent increasing values of f of w. So if I fix W1 and I look at how f of W depends on W2, it's quadratic. So it's going to be a parabola in W2. Similarly, if I fix W2 and look at how it depends on W1, it's also going to be a parabola because then this is a constant term and I just have dependence on W1 squared here. So these cross sections for fixed W1 and W2 are parabolas and those are joined by these circular contours of constant values for the squared error. So we see that we have a bowl-shaped surface, the set of all W1 and W2 that have the same cost function. Those are circles parallel to the W1, W2 plane. And if I look at the individual coordinates, the components W1 or W2, I have a parabolic behavior in each coordinate. Let's consider a slightly more complicated example where A transpose A is diagonal, where it has values lambda 1 squared and lambda 2 squared on the diagonal. So these are no longer equal. And we have, as before, the value of the squared error can be written as W minus W0 quantity transpose times A transpose A times the quantity W minus W0 plus our constant error squared term. We'll assume for convenience that the larger value on the diagonal is in the lambda 1 position. Now we're writing these as lambda 1 squared and lambda 2 squared to denote that they both have to be positive. Otherwise, A transpose A would not be a positive definite matrix. Now let's consider 
the surface, in other words, what values of w is this term in the cost function equal to a constant? That set of w will all have the same value for the cost function. In this case, if you multiply this out in terms of lambda 1 squared w1 and w2, you see that you have an equation lambda 1 squared times the quantity w1 minus w1 0 squared plus lambda 2 squared w2 minus w2 0 squared equals c squared. And this should be a somewhat familiar function of w1 and w2 because this is the equation for ellipse. So it's an ellipse with a center at w0. It has a major axis of 2c over lambda 2, a minor axis of 2c over lambda 1. Now, as before, if I hold w1 fixed, then my cost function f of w is a quadratic function of w2 and it's going to be parabolic in that cross-section. Similarly, if I hold w2 fixed, it's going to be quadratic function of w1 and thus parabolic in the w1 direction. So we can sketch this. Again, the ellipses that we have in our contours here are centered at w0. Then as I go away from w0, the c squared value for the ellipse increases and thus the value of the squared error cost function also increases as I go away. Now this example I've shown here has lambda 1 squared equals 4, lambda 2 squared equals 1, so the major axis is twice as long as the minor axis. We can also attempt to sketch this in three dimensions and we'll have the w1 and w2 as a horizontal plane and then f, the value of the cost function, be the height above that plane. As before, we're going to have elliptical cross-sections parallel to the w1, w2 plane along constant values of w1 or constant values of w2. We have parabolas. So the bottom of this bowl is situated directly over the point w0, and the height of the bottom over the bowl is d transpose pa per times d, because that's the minimum possible value for the cost function. Now both cases we've looked at so far in the two-dimensional example have had A transpose A diagonal. And it turns out that the case where A transpose A is not a diagonal matrix can be handled in a similar fashion with a slight twist. Now A transpose A can always be expressed as a decomposition, a matrix U times a diagonal matrix lambda squared times that same matrix U transpose. Now, I'm not going to prove where this decomposition comes from. I will tell you that this is the eigen decomposition of A transpose A, and that's a topic that we're going to look at in some detail in another lecture. But for now, what's important is that lambda squared is a diagonal matrix, and it has these values lambda 1 squared, lambda 2 squared, through lambda p squared on the diagonal, and the columns of the matrix U are orthonormal. So if I define u to be u1, u2, through up, that means that u sub l transpose times u sub k is equal to 1 when l is equal to k, and it's 0 if l is not equal to k. So each of these u's has unit length, and it's orthogonal to all the other u's. So if I look at u transpose u, that's going to have rows u1 transpose, u2 transpose, through up transpose, times columns u1, u2, through up. And if you look at the various entries in the matrix represented by this product of u transpose times u, we end up with various terms of ul transpose times uk. And so when l is equal to k, on the diagonal I get exactly ones. When l is not equal to k, those are the cases in the matrix where I'm at an off-diagonal element, and those end up being zero. So u transpose u is equal to the identity. This is a special matrix whose inverse is equal to its transpose. So let's get back to our problem of trying to understand our squared error cost function in the case where A transpose A is not diagonal. Now what I'm going to do is take this quadratic term that we've been studying and replace A transpose A with this decomposition. And by the way, it's a simple matter to compute this decomposition. It's available in almost every software, although the actual algorithm is fairly complicated and not something we're going to discuss.
So if I substitute A transpose A by U lambda squared U transpose, I can then group U with W minus W zero, and I'll call U transpose times the quantity W minus W zero, I'll call that a new vector Z. And then on the left-hand side, this turns out to be Z transpose. So I can rewrite this equation that's involved in the squared error as Z transpose lambda squared Z. Now in this case, lambda is a diagonal matrix. So we know that this being constant is going to have the equation for an ellipse. So our squared error cost function has elliptical contours as it did before. It's just they're in the Z directions. So the major and minor axes are oriented according to the orientation of Z. And the orientation of Z is not the same as the orientation of W because of this transformation by U transpose. Now because U transpose U is the identity, I can write that W minus W zero is equal to U times Z. In other words, the vector W minus W zero can be expressed as a sum of u1 vector plus u2 where the coefficients associated with those bases u1 and u2 are z1 and z2. So if our major and minor axes are oriented along z1 and z2 then in terms of w they're going to be oriented along u1 and u2. w0 again just defines the center. So I've sketched that here and I've drawn W0, the center, in pink, and then I've got some orientation U1 associated with Z1 and some orientation U2 associated with coefficient Z2. I'm going to represent an arbitrary point W as a weighted combination of something along the U1 axis plus something along the U2 axis. And this leads to elliptical contours that are oriented along the U1 and U2 axes. So what's happened when A transpose A is not diagonal is we've taken the elliptical contours we had that had major and minor axes along the W1 and W2 directions and we've rotated them to be lined up with U1 and U2. So this generalization where A transpose A is not diagonal simply amounts to a rotation of the axes. The bottom of the bowl is still centered at W0 we still have elliptical contours, and we're going to have parabolic cross sections along the U1 and U2 axes, as we did before. It's just there's this rotation that's introduced associated with this non-diagonal behavior of A transpose A. So our bowl now, in three dimensions, if we think of F of W as being the height above the W1, W2 plane, it's still a bowl-shaped surface. It's an elliptical bowl and it has parabolic cross sections along the Z1 and Z2 uh, coordinates which correspond to the U1 and U2 directions in W. So in summary, the squared error cost function F of W represents a bowl-shaped surface and it's concave up. The contours of constant value of F of W are elliptical and the major and minor axes directions correspond to the eigenvectors of A transpose A while the major and minor axis lengths correspond to the eigenvalues of A transpose A. This bowl has a unique bottom, or a minimum, at W0. Now we've only been able to draw this for P equals 2, but the concepts extend. In particular, if we look at P equals 3, then our contours of constant values of F of W are going to be egg-shaped surfaces or ellipsoids that are centered on W0. So in this case W is a three-dimensional vector and as we get away from W0 we have these shells. Being able to visualize this cost function as a bowl is really useful and will be something we'll return to as we look at variations on the least squares problem in the future.